Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In the last video we discussed the monopole and the fact that it has never been measured at L2. In this video I wish to turn my attention to the reference loads for the LFI on the Planck satellite and highlight that these devices never had the ability to properly function as black bodies. Here is a schematic of the reference loads on the Planck satellite and their incorporation into the Planck radiometers for the LFI. As I discussed in this video, the LFI is made up of 22 pseudocorrelation differential radiometers operating at 30, 44, and 70 gigahertz. These radiometers compare signal from the sky with a reference load on board the satellite, as you can see in this diagram. Each radiometer is equipped with its own 4K load. Now it is critical for the proper function of the LFI that the reference loads are actually acting as black bodies near 4 Kelvin, but it appears that this has not been achieved. The details of the reference loads on Planck can be found in this paper, and I have previously discussed the problem with the 4K loads in detail here. I have also prepared a paper relative to testing black bodies with return loss measurements, which you can review if interested. The reference loads are made up of three components and each should be carefully analyzed. First, a small microwave horn is designed to bring the 4K reference signal to the radiometer. It is critical that this horn not allow microwave signals from entering the radiometer which were not produced by the 4K target. The target signal must also not escape without entering the horn. Yet the microwave horn is physically separated from the black body by a distance of about 1.5 millimeters. This separation helps ensure thermal isolation between the horn at approximately 20 Kelvin and the reference load at 4 Kelvin. However, this gap might enable microwave signals to leak into the reference horn which were not produced by the target. Microwaves are notorious for being able to travel through such gaps. For instance, even in the radio range, an MRI scanner room must be tested to ensure that there are no such gaps and those systems are operating at much lower frequency. High field MRI scanner rooms often have steel walls and all seams are welded closed and gaps sealed with copper tape. The RF doors and frames are equipped with metallic contacts which form a tight seal for all RF. As such, it is clear that the 1.5 millimeter gap on the reference loads cannot prevent microwave signal not generated by the target from entering the radiometer. The Planck team was aware of this problem and they modeled the possible spillover with finite element methods. They are concerned with signal from two sources. First, they must ensure that no signal from the 20 Kelvin environment surrounding the reference loads can enter the gap. They contend that a rejection on the order of minus 20 dB exists for such signal. Since we are dealing with power, here is the equation we need to consider. In this case, the power difference in dB is equal to 10 times the log of the measured power over the initial power. As a result, they expect a rejection of roughly a factor of 100. They also have to address stray sky signals, and here they argue for a rejection on the order of minus 60 dB. That is a factor of roughly a million. These numbers are very dependent on proper modeling of all boundaries and interfaces, which is not a trivial problem at these frequencies. As such, these numbers should be taken with a grain of salt. But the Planck team does not quantify the signal loss from the 4K load itself to the outside. Based on the 20 dB rejection of the 20 Kelvin signal, one might assume a 1% loss, which is not much. But we will return to this issue. Second, an aluminum casing filled with Echosorb is supposed to be acting as a black body target. The Echosorb used in attempting to make this black body is often employed to absorb microwaves in anechoic chambers. According to the manufacturer, Echosorb is a high loss microwave absorber, which is designed to attenuate electromagnetic waves by converting RF energy into heat. The Planck team utilizes two types of Echosorb, known as CR110 and CR117 respectively, which are shown in different colors on the diagram. Each of these is laden with iron powder within a hardened resin matrix when cured. CR110 provides an attenuation of approximately 6 to 8 dB per centimeter of material, although this value has not been verified at cryogenic temperatures. CR110 is used to make the central cone of the target and much of the first layer of material. Since it provides very little attenuation per centimeter, CR110 by itself would make a very poor black body. Conversely, for the back of the target, the Planck team utilizes CR117 Echosorb, which has a much more powerful attenuation on the order of 90 dB per centimeter, as you can learn in this recent paper. Given the thickness of material used, that should correspond to roughly a 30 dB attenuation. But again, no attenuation values are available at cryogenic temperatures. Ideally, this material should provide enough performance to act as a black body. 
However, beyond its good attenuation, CR117 has another feature. It has a rather non-negligible thermal conductivity. For instance, as one can learn in this paper, aluminum has a thermal conductivity of 9.53 at 4 Kelvin. The thermal conductivity of CR110 is 100 times lower with a value of 0.08 at 300 Kelvin. However, CR117 has a thermal conductivity of roughly 0.9 at 300 Kelvin. As such, remember that though CR117 is a rather good absorber, it has a non-negligible thermal conductance, and this is important to keep in mind. In order to contain the reference target material, the Planck satellite uses casings. A different size aluminum casing is employed at each frequency. At 30 GHz, the casing has dimensions of 3.3 by 3.3 by about 2 cm. At 44 GHz, it is 2.5 by 2.5 by 1.5 cm. At 70 GHz, it is 1.6 by 1.4 by 1 cm. The third and final part of the assembly is comprised of conductive steel washers and anchoring screws which provide a conductive heat path into the 4K shield of the satellite. These act to ensure that the reference loads remain at 4K by channeling heat out of these devices. Immediately, it is apparent that this design is thermodynamically flawed. In constructing black bodies, it is entirely appropriate to pump heat conductively into the device, thereby raising its temperature. When this occurs and the black body has no other conductive or convective paths available to it, heat can only escape through radiative processes. As a result, the black body will function properly. However, the converse is not true. One cannot construct a black body by allowing heat to escape conductively, because there is no way to ensure that proper emission will take place. The temperature of an object can be maintained by conductive cooling, and no radiation needs to occur. Again, one cannot build a proper black body if the device has access to conductive cooling. This demonstrates that the engineers for the Planck satellite chose to sidestep the interplay between conduction, convection, and thermal radiation in heat transfer. The reference loads must not have any conductive paths available to them. In order to assess the quality of a black body in the microwave, it is common practice to measure return loss. When making return loss measurements, the target is first presented with incident radiation. Let us examine this question using the 4K reference loads and the horns designed by the Planck team. First, let us begin with the horn far from the target and remove all the echo sorbs such that the target becomes reflective. If the target is perfectly reflective, the return loss should be equal to 0 dB because the ratio of incident to reflected radiation will be identical and the log of 1 is equal to 0. If only a small fraction of the incident radiation is returned to the detector, then the return loss will be negative. For instance, let us replace the echo sorb. If 1% of the radiation is reflected back, then the return loss will be minus 20 dB, which is the Planck specification for the black body targets. If 10% of the incident power is reflected back, then the return loss will be minus 10 dB. That all sounds very simple, but does a return loss of minus 20 dB really imply that a nearly ideal black body has been created? I treated this question in detail in this paper. In short, the answer is no. Just because a signal has not been returned to the detector does not mean that it was all absorbed on first pass. For instance, some of the signal might just leak around the target and never return to the detector. In fact, this is exactly what the calculations of the Planck team itself demonstrates as shown in figure 10 of this paper. Recall the 1.5 millimeter gap between the horn and the target? Let us adjust our geometry to meet this condition. Incident signal can simply spill out from the gap and this was computed to occur. As a result, even if the Planck team claims that they met the requirements for a minus 20 dB return loss, it is clear that leakage is affecting this number significantly. Beyond spillover, there are other possible problems with the return loss measurements. For instance, if an incident signal penetrates the target, it must be absorbed on first pass. It should not traverse the echosorb, become reflected at the casing, and then be absorbed as it tries to exit the target. That would result in a return loss value which is lower than actually warranted by the nature of the absorber, making the target appear more black than it really is. The Planck team cannot account for this problem. In addition, when a signal is directed towards a metallic target, standing waves might be created if the dimensions of the cavity are the proper size. This is exactly what is observed in the Planck test data. Just examine this plot for the return loss measurements for the 30 GHz target assembly. If you examine this plot, you immediately notice a pronounced drop in return loss near 29 GHz. There are three closed dips in the return loss signal, and these are clear signs of resonance phenomena. 
In fact, it is easy to estimate that these standing waves cause the return loss to drop by approximately minus 20 to 25 dB in this frequency range. Just examine the plot and you'll see a drop from minus 25 to minus 50. That corresponds to strong resonant behavior as the casing dimensions of 3.3 centimeter is equal to about three wavelengths near 29 gigahertz. This demonstrates conclusively that these targets are not acting as proper black bodies at 30 gigahertz. Similar resonant behavior is observed at both 44 and 70 gigahertz. The Planck team cannot permit the existence of standing waves within the targets as this is a sure sign that they are not properly acting as black bodies. When this resonant behavior is taken in combination with the spillover through the gap and the fact that the reference loads are being conductively cooled and do not have to emit a single photon to maintain their 4 Kelvin temperature, it is clear that significant problems exist with the 4K reference loads on the Planck satellite. Given such poor black body design, the Planck team should definitely temper their claims at 30, 44, and 70 gigahertz. In reality, they have no idea what they are sampling because fundamental flaws exist in their instrument design. Well, that is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.